Okay, I think we just kick off and if anyone is joining in as we go, that would be that's just great. Um, so welcome. Today, I suppose we're talking about how to parent our kids through their real and virtual worlds. I'm going to take a little bit of a different slant on it, but first off, I'm just going to introduce myself and what I do and what brought me to where I am today. So I suppose I am the founder of Jumpstart Your Confidence and author of The Parent. Um, Jumpstart Your Confidence was founded about 12 years ago when I saw a, just a gap in the market really with an area where kids really didn't have that space to be supported. Um, and uh, from an outside voice, I suppose, not an emotionally connected family member. And it didn't necessarily mean these kids are, had to be very troubled or anything. Jumpstart deals with everything from confidence building to dealing with exam pressures, uh, motivation, peer pressure, friendship issues, the basics that I think we've all struggled with along the way. But you'd be amazed at the difference you can make with a little bit of mentoring. I work with A to 18s. I probably work with about 1,200 kids a year between schools, well, pre-COVID, and privately in Cork City. And the kids are really open to just that little bit of support and an outside voice to help them through. But today I'm going to give you a few ideas. I suppose my ideas are coming from the kids' perspective, which is a little bit different. The information I've gathered over the last 10 years is really so helpful to me. And that's the whole reason why I wrote the book, because these kids are teaching me every day on the different issues that they're coming up with, what their struggles are, what helps them, what hinders them. And that's, you know, whether it's from school, whether it's from peers, friendships, family, whatever it may be. So I'm going to run through a lot of different areas and um, we'll focus a little bit on confidence building, because to be fair, a confident, secure, happy child is a child that's not really going to struggle as much when it comes to technology and social media and generally um, within their friendship issues, within their friendship groups, at least um, throughout their growing years. So <clears throat> I think we just kick off with an area of positive self-esteem. And when I ask kids what self-esteem means, um, to be honest, a lot of them look at me kind of blankly. Maybe it's not a word we use enough. But the answer I always give them is, it's your opinion of you. And, you know, whether it's kids, teenagers, adults, the, the main opinion and the most important opinion that affects everything we do in our lives has to be our own opinion. You know, whether we believe we can or whether we believe we can't. Um, and with kids, I suppose, you know, the relationship between parent and child is the most important relationship they will ever have in their lives. It mightn't always seem it when they're fighting and, you know, looking at us as if we've grown horns, but it is the most important. And I think when we look back to our parenting and we look at the relationships that we have or have had with our parents along the way, that really explains an awful lot to us maybe as to how important our relationship is with our kids. And I think life can become so busy that we can forget the basics and the essentials of what that relationship means and the important aspects within that relationship just to help keep it open and strong and accepting and all those things that really matter to your kids. So when it comes to self-esteem, um, I suppose praising for achievement and effort is so important. I've come across so many parents and kids who feel, you know, that they're, the kids, I suppose, feeling that they're being judged on academic results, judged on, for the younger ones, the drum conjures. I've heard parents say, she got eight, why isn't she getting 10? I mean, that just has to stop. I mean, our, our academic system does not support all our kids on any level. You know, it is very academically based. Academia, in my opinion, is one strength that our kids may have, but thank God they have hundreds of other strengths, but we do tend to focus in on that academic strength. And that's an awful shame really, because they have so much more to give. So just be a little bit wary of how you do praise them. And, you know, if a kid is working hard, and I'll always say this when I'm working with them, if they're working hard and they're putting in that effort, that their result is good enough. It has to be good enough. You know, we have to be very, very careful on how we treat the kids, especially the kids who mightn't be as academic. And they are walking into that system every single day, a lot of them feeling less than. Now that is just wrong on every level. So we do need at home to be very aware of the situation they're in and very aware of the judgments they can. And to be honest, a lot of the kids will put that judgment on themselves, nothing to do with us. But we have to be aware and we have to really talk to them openly that if they're working hard and once they're putting in the effort, the actual number in that result really is quite irrelevant. Um, making comparisons, I suppose, to other siblings, cousins, the neighbor, the friend, it's lethal. 
And I think if we're honest with ourselves and we look back, if I'm sure most of us were compared to someone along the way. I know I certainly was. And it hurts and it's not fair. And I suppose, why? how can we compare our kids to other people? They're not them. You know, so look at your own kids' strengths, at your own kids' abilities, at the effort they're putting in, and really try not to make those comparisons. And if you do make the comparison and you feel it was a bit hurtful and unnecessary, just be big enough to say sorry. And I'm going to repeat that the whole way through the session. Um, because to say sorry just puts a lid on it. Whereas if we don't say sorry and parents might say to me, ah, they know I didn't mean it. Uh, no, they don't. Because if those words come out of your mouth, they presume you mean it. So just to be big enough, apologize and let it go. And the false expectations is very linked in because it's the same kind of idea. Um, but unfortunately, the false expectations is a huge issue I come across, especially working with maybe 15 to 18s who are heading into the senior cycle in school and presume, you know, they're so confused and so lost because they feel their parents think they're going to achieve ABC, whatever it may be. They know they're not. They know they don't have it. And believe me, these kids are smart. All of these kids are smart and they know exactly what they're capable of when they put the work in. So if they're saying that they're not going to achieve whatever result or they're not going to get into whatever course, talk to them. You know, there's a thousand ways to do courses now. And, you know, that's another positive, I suppose, of technology. We, we have come such a long way. There is choices for every aspect of jobs, of courses, of apprenticeships, of everything. So our kids are not going to be stuck. You know, so give them the benefit that if they feel they're not going to achieve a certain result, listen. We need to listen because our kids cannot be feeling like they're disappointing you and that they're less than because their capabilities don't match up to maybe what you expected them to be. And the sad thing is, like, I really do this, see this at, with some kids at eight, nine, ten years of age who are judged solely on getting their 9 out of 10 or their 10 out of 10. And if they get 8, it's like, where did the other two go? Instead of saying, yay, 8 is great. Well done you. Let's learn what you missed out on. And you just learn from mistakes. You learn from getting things wrong. And that's the way life runs for all of us. I think we have to be big enough to be able to accept that we need to make mistakes along the way. Um, and and self-esteem, I suppose, when it comes to child's interests versus parents' interests, this is a big one. I suppose when... Um, you know, sometimes even before our kids are born, we have this idea in our head, they're going to be the hockey player or the swimmer or the musician or the artist or whatever it may be. I know my husband and I, we probably had this definitely because we were both very sporty and presumed that our kids would be sporty. But uh, one day at a football match with my 12 year old daughter, as we stood at the sideline and watched her, there wasn't much football going on to be fair. She was pirouetting and dancing around the pitch. She'd asked us so many times, could she do drama and musical theatre? And I suppose because of our upbringing, because of our own interests, we just thought sport was it. It was the most important thing. Nothing else was going to really make up for that. But eventually, after watching these games and realising that really this wasn't happening, we did give in and we did get her set up. And she lived and breathed those drama and musical theatre classes her whole life. She's now finished her degree in musical in drama. And, you know, I don't know where it'll bring her but I know she's exceptionally happy in what she's doing. And I do question if I was in a position at that time not to take heed of what was going on in front of my eyes and just presume that I knew best and push, pushed her to keep that sport going and not open her eyes to the creative side, what would have happened? I honestly can't answer that, but I think it's so important for all of us to really watch what are our kids' interests. And they might be so far from what we expected but they're their interests. You know, they're not an extension of us, just like we weren't an extension of our parents. They're individuals, they have their own dreams and ambitions, and they need to know from a very early age that that's okay. And thank God we're all different, and thank God we've all different interests because it'd be a very funny world if we weren't. But watch them. I'm not saying if you're sending your four-year-old into dancing and she's bawling, crying and hanging onto your leg, that, oh my God, that's not for her. Not at all. That's a completely different thing. But if you peep in the window, which I used to do at times with another one, and you realize that they're happy out in there, then that's perfectly fine. But if you're, I'm just going to use a sporty one. If your 13-year-old son maybe is into football, rugby, whatever it may be, well, you feel he is and you feel he should be. 
but he's going out there to training and he's not getting picked on any team and he's getting slagged off a bit because he isn't actually that sporty. That's annihilating his confidence and that's a really hard place for them to be. And I have worked with so many young boys and teenage boys who, and it's not that they're not sporty, it's just that maybe they're not going to be the top 15, the top 30 in their school or on their, in their club. And um, unfortunately, the world we live in today, if you're not in that top group, it does become a bit irrelevant, which is all wrong, without a shadow of a doubt, but just watch them. And when they come in from training, how are they feeling? You know, are they going into themselves a little bit? Are they coming in the door bouncing and happy? You know your kids best and you will know what is right for them. And if it's not right for them, listen, listen to them, but watch their behaviours, watch their reactions. And just because you may have hoped and thought that your child was going to be one thing, whether that's sporty, musician, creative, whatever it may be, and they turn out to be something completely different. So what? You know, what do we all want? I think all any of us ever want is for our kids to be happy and they cannot be happy if they're living their lives to please somebody else or to fit into someone else's belief and dream that's not theirs. So just be a little bit open maybe when it comes to that. And I suppose society is a big part to play in this as well because sometimes society makes us believe that our kids should be doing A, B and C. Why? And why do we listen? Again, they're individual, they're our kids get to know them, get to understand what makes them tick, get to understand their passions and their interests and allow them to let those passions and interests grow. And I guarantee you, you will have a hell of a lot happier child and a more confident child in your family home. Um, we're moving on to communication, but I'll touch on communication again later on. So I'm just gonna work, deal with the little ones at the minute. I think communication, one of the biggest problems with communication is the illusion that it's actually taken place. And a lot of the time, maybe, well, especially when they're small, I suppose they come into us with problems that we obviously don't see as a problem. Maybe your five-year-old's pigtails are crooked or your six-year-old son's tracksuit isn't the right color, whatever it may be. But look, if it wasn't an issue to them, they wouldn't be coming to you. So in their little world, in their little young heads, this is a problem for them. Listen. Let them know that you are willing to understand that you're willing to take on their problem and help them to sort it out. And that, you know, you're very aware of their presence and their feelings and what matters to them. So just listen, because when that starts from a young age, we'll come to it later on when we work up to the teens. But communication is vital, lads. And I suppose with technology, and I should have said earlier, like technology, let's face it, it has saved us for the last year and a half through COVID. There is no doubt about that. I believe technology is incredibly positive in so many ways, without a shadow of a doubt, to us, to our kids, to the world they're growing up in, to what it opens up to them. The list is endless. But what I am going to focus on is some of the negatives that I see with the kids I work with. Um, in their use of technology and the effect it can have on them. So I'm not knocking it, not by any stretch, because it is wonderful. But it, this is my experience. These are the kids I work with. And these are the things I'm going to just follow on to you because it's a no brainer to pass this information on to the adults. So with communication, if our kids cannot communicate with us, where are they going to go? Who are they going to look to, to listen to them, to speak to? I have worked with kids as young as 10 who are turning to their online worlds for this. And that is a really dangerous place. And it's a place you do not want to see your kids going because you have no control over it. There are no boundaries, no rules, no regulations. And I know we might think we have it all sussed. And I know probably a lot of people here are really techy, but you know what? Our kids are smart and they can get one over on us so fast. So let them know they can come to you no matter what is going on you will be there and that you will listen and you will try and understand and try and help them out. Um, as I said, like the, there are so many positives to social media, but we do need to find that balance. And the kids know this, you know, as I said before, they're savvy, they're smart. They know a lot of their usage of social media is exhausting and it's affecting them in numerous negative ways. But there's a lot of positives too. So it's just get the boundaries in place. Like I've worked with kids going into secondary school where the parents say, no way you should get a phone. I just see all the hassle and the bullying and the trouble. We can't do that. This is the world they're in. 
they have to be able to be savvy and understand it. But our job, we give them the technology, whatever we feel is age appropriate, but we put our boundaries in place. And that is huge. And I would say the one thing from day one, you really try is do not let them get in the habit of plugging any device in their bedroom. So many kids, it has become so normal for kids to be on their phone or devices at two and three and four in the morning. I have spoken to thousands of parents who will believe 100% it is not their kids. They would never be online that late. And they're wrong because the peer pressure can be huge. Once they get in the habit of it, their sleep patterns can go. That can become very normal for them to be on late at night. So no plugging in anything in the bedroom. They'll moan and groan, but if we stick to it, Honestly, kids are pretty good that way. Generally, it's us kind of crack up and we give up and we just let them have it just for a bit of peace. So if we stick to it, they'll be okay. The other boundaries I'd say are important and that includes us. You know, it's not just a one-way street here. So if you're having a family meal and you decide no phones at the family table, then you don't have any phones either. That can be hard for a lot of us and a lot of parents, but let's face it, it has to be one rule for all. So I think family meals, which I know can't happen that often during the school year, well, pre-COVID, I suppose, but hopefully going forward when they have sports and different things going on after school, it can be very hard to sit down together. But we do need to sit down together, even if it's just at the weekend, once a week, whenever you get the chance. And when you do get that chance, because it is the only chance probably that the family can actually sit down and speak to each other together and get a handle on what's going on, get rid of the phones, just make it a habit. Again, if we stick to the habit, they'll be fine. If we start picking up our phone because we're really busy or we really have to do something, no, we don't. It can wait. It can always wait. So just give them a chance, get the boundaries in place, trust your own kids. You know, if you feel your child is age appropriate, ready for whatever it may be, then you go with that. You don't have to be taking advice from anybody else on that one. Listen to yourself within your family home, you make those decisions, but always get those boundaries in place as fast as you can, because they're the things that are gonna really help. I've worked with teenagers who have said, I wish they'd take my phone off at night. Genuinely, that has actually happened. Just take the choice out of their hands. They're not able, and they need us just to put those boundaries in place. And then when they are in line, and when they are gaming, and when they're at that time that they're allowed, let them off, you know, just leave them alone, but get the boundaries in place first. When it comes to, I suppose, traditional play and allowing our kids use their own minds a little bit more, they do need it, you know, and they might say they're bored. Great, let them be bored, because when they're bored, they have to use their imagination and their mind to come up with something else to do. So that's kind of an important one. Um, it's easier for us at times. Look, I threw my kids in front of Barney for years if I needed a bit of space. That's normal. You might be out for dinner and it might help to put an iPad up just to keep them quiet, whatever it may be. Completely normal. When I talk about boundaries and too much social media, it's really for the kids who have their head on that screen three quarters of the day. And there is a lot of it. So just get the boundary. And the traditional play is vital because it teaches our kids how to interact with each other face to face, how to win and lose face to face, how to deal with other people by reading maybe their emotions and their feelings in their face by getting that vibe off them, whatever's going on. And it's vitally important, guys, because so many kids find it so hard to have face-to-face -face communication when they spend so much time online. I've had situations in my own home even where, you know, there might be a group of friends online, but if they meet face-to-face and, -face, and I might say to one of them, but you're, you're friends with her. And she's like, yeah, 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 but they don't speak. There is no communication because they can do it online but they find it really hard to do it face to face and that cannot be allowed to happen. You know, our virtual worlds are important and they're wonderful and there's so much good there, but our real world is where we live. And I think that conversation really has to come up an awful lot more within the family home. Spending time with the people that really matter, um, you know, and allowing our kids play dates. You know, I know they're hard, especially for working parents. It doesn't have to be midweek. It can be after a match. It could be after over the weekend, any time. Trying to get our kids together without devices so they learn how to traditionally play with each other, how to interact, how to connect. All those things are so important. Um, social media is an addiction. We all know that. I would imagine we are all addicted to some level without a doubt. Um, it's a discussion that needs to be had. You know, we 
use our phones in all the ways we do, but we do need to be sure that we are ruling the phone or the device, that it's not the other way around. All our kids and us need to know that we can switch it off. You know, if you're watching family movies, really try and get the kids to switch it off. They think they can be in two places at once. No, they can't. Try and teach them the importance of being present in something that's actually happening that's important in your home. Because otherwise they get in the habit of never being present. And that's not really a very healthy way mentally for anybody to live. So just keep an eye on that area as well. Um, just briefly, I'll touch on these. I think we all know it. It's just uh, reminders. Poor communication and social skills. I've just talked about that. Boredom, absolutely a problem. But we need to be bored. We all need to be bored. Impatience is going to be there because everything is immediate online. They've got, you know, <clears throat> they've got so used to pressing a button and something, a response, that when you go back into the real world and things might be a little bit slower, and the reactions might be a little bit slower. There could be a lot of impatience there. You know, I would say try and work on that within the family home, that there's just a little bit more downtime, maybe a little bit of breathing exercises where needed when the impatience is getting a bit out of control. Um, but just keep a little eye on it. Lack of imagination and coordination. I think, again, an experience of where I'm working and where I'm coming from, I work with a lot of creative kids. And creative kids need boredom and they need to be allowed for their minds to open up. I think all kids do, but your creative kids really, really need that or they just don't feel right. Um, what our kids are capable of coming up with all on their own in the world they're in is huge. Let's try and encourage them to use that imagination, be individual thinkers, come up with their own ideas, whatever they may be, and train them into that way of thinking individually because that is the one thing I do see with social media a lot is we have a bit of a sheep thing going on where people can follow each other and get involved in what other people think they should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. We need to pull on that individuality. It is hugely important to all of our kids. Exposure to age inappropriate content is a massive problem, massive. I could go on about this one all on its own for the next hour. Um, but what I am gonna say grooming, is, a, is an issue you know it, it might be somebody down the road it might be an older neighbor cousin friend it is happening um, i'm not freaking people out but i just think we need to be careful that our kids are communicating well with somebody whether that's us a mentor a family member a grandparent whoever it is in their world they need to have someone they can communicate with so they're not turning into that other area of the grooming and looking for someone um, else to communicate with online the porn scenarios out of control it's um affecting our young people it's obviously affecting our old people too but it is affecting our young people in a huge way and this conversation has got to happen again if you feel that it's not a conversation you're comfortable having you just find somebody who can have that conversation with your kids and preferably someone they look up to and respect so they'll actually listen but they need to understand that porn is not real life and they need to understand the values of the way they should treat each other we'll come to that again in a minute but the inappropriate content online, we have got to remember, we might be stopping our little Johnny from walking to the shop because we're nervous, but he's coming home and he's joining an online world that we have very little control over. So be careful on your boundaries there. The online boundaries need to be very, very tight just to protect them. That's all, because the inappropriate content is inappropriate. It is really inappropriate. And maybe we all at times just need to go online and see what they are actually able to get on because it's very hard to understand if we don't actually see it. So just keep an eye. Sleep deprivation is something, especially with the teenagers. Um, I know I spoke about having the devices plugged in out of the bedroom, but sleep deprivation has such an impact on our teens. They're already hormonal lunatics at half the time, dramatic, reactive, etc etc a lack of sleep is just going to add to that by a hundred percent so be careful they need to sleep just like we need to sleep i know i can't function without sleep they're over emotional they can't work through things they can't concentrate there's friend issues that can go pear-shaped because they just can't cope they have to be able to sleep get enough sleep so that they can actually function the next day for exam students when we go into junior cycle and senior cycle you know, these kids 
but we have to be able to get step in there and make sure that they're getting enough sleep. And yes, they'll fight and they'll rant and they'll rave, but it is our job, lads, we're their parents, we're not their friend. If we feel that they're not getting enough sleep, then it is 100% our responsibility to make sure that they get that sleep, whatever it means. I've had to at times wake up at you know, one in the morning to check and make sure that there isn't any second phone going on or any other device that I didn't know was around. And that's just us keeping on top of it because we have to, because as I said earlier, they're 10 steps ahead of us. So we really do need to keep an eye on the sleep. It is hugely important. Surviving the teen years. I know when, before my eldest became a teenager, um, a friend of mine said to me, um, she went up the stairs one day and she came down at 13 and she was a different child. I didn't know who she was. Now, thankfully, I didn't quite have that experience. But I think when we look at what I'm going to talk about now and try and keep the lines of communication open, the level of acceptance open and so much more, we don't tend to have as rocky a road in the teenage years. Now, it's supposed to be rocky. That's just what teens are. To be fair to the teens, and I think it's very important to us, for us to remember this as well, they have so much going on, you know, especially for the crowd starting into secondary school for the first time. Their heads are all over the place. They're trying to fit in. They're trying to look right. They're trying to act right. They're trying to speak right. And when they come home and they vent, it's only because it is their safe place to vent. They can vent at us because they know we're going to love them no matter what. They don't really have that space anywhere else. So just try to remember your own teenagers, what upset you, what you struggled with. Was it friendships? Was it body image? Was it relationships? Was it school? Was it exams? Was it your relationship at home? What was it? Because genuinely, most of that has not changed. So I think reminding ourselves of what life was like for us when we were our teenager's age might just bring us back into understanding how tough a time this can actually be. Talking to your teen is vital. You know, I think I learned the art of active listening when I began training um, for my own business. And active listening is something I think we think we're doing, but very rarely do we actually do it. I think a parent's automatic response is to jump in and try and solve the situation as quickly as possible because we know best. But actually, many times we don't know best. And many of the times, if we actually zip it until our child stops talking, they'll actually have worked it out for themselves. We'll also have gotten a full picture. We'll also have shown them that we care and that we're willing to listen. Because when we jump in with that advice over and over and over, we just sound like a broken record. And let me tell you, they are not listening. If we don't give them the respect to listen, how do we expect them to give us the respect to listen to? So by teaching your kids active listening, I think it's one of the greatest gifts you can give them, to be honest, when it comes to growing up and later in life and being able to communicate properly. Being able to listen and really hear what's going on is so important. Um, you know, if you think about it, if you were, if you had something important to say and you go to that most important person in your life, just think in your head, whoever that might be, that person you look up to and you love and you respect. And they fob you off because, and you know, they have no interest in listening, really. How does that make you feel? Annoyed, upset, disappointed, all of the above and more. All of it. And that's how our kids feel. So as much as we mightn't be in the mood to listen or, and if you don't have time, absolutely, that happens, obviously. But just say, can we talk about it later? I just need to get this finished or whatever you're doing. But do try to, not to forget. I put a reminder on my phone to remind me later on to go back and talk about it because they would not have come to you in the first place if it wasn't important to them. So that listening and active li listening is so important. Um, picking your battles, you know, again, remembering when you were a teenager, you push the boundaries. That's what you actually do. You think you're all grown up. You're not. They think they don't need us anymore. They absolutely do. But we have to play the game a little bit here and play a bit clever. They need to feel that they're growing up, they're independent, they're an adult. We know none of that is true, but we also have to allow them feel that they're growing up. So whether that's allowing them put on the nail polish that you're allergic to, 
whether it's giving them the freedom to dress whatever way they want to. I mean, once they're covered, you know, who cares? Let them have their own style. They'll grow. If it's a bit mad, they will probably grow out of it anyway, but allow them to be. The battles you want to really pick are the ones that put your kids in danger. Whereas if we go harping on about every little thing they do and then something big happens, are they going to feel they can come to us? Highly unlikely, because they'll be terrified. Now, I have picked up, met, rescued, whatever words, kids from the side of a road, after too much drink, terrified to phone home. And that is a really dangerous place. And there's a lot of kids being left in that position. I do think all any of us want is to feel that our kids can pick up the phone to us if something goes wrong. They have to be able to. And if it's not us, there might be an aunt, or as I said earlier, uh, maybe a granny, whoever it may be, somebody that they know they can pick up the phone to if they get into difficulty, because they do get into difficulty. And you might think it's not going to be your Mary or your Tommy, but you do not know what is going to happen here. Just allow them have that safe place that they know they can go to. Of course, there will be repercussions and punishments or whatever else, but they have to be relative to the crime too, relative to whatever's going on. Um, so do pick your battles. Don't have an argument over every silly little thing that's going on because it's exhausting for you. It's exhausting for them and they just switch off. You know, so allow the little things pass. When something happens and you're about to react and jump in, just take a breath. Just take a breath and say, is this actually worth it? And nine times out of 10, it's not. And when you trust your kids to, to be themselves and to you trust their actions and you allow them know that you trust them, they're not going to go far wrong. But they do need to know that you're there if anything goes wrong. So just leave the objections, leave the fights leave the arguments, leave the unnecessary reactions to things that matter. And if you do jump in, which we all do when we're a bit stressed or a bit busy or whatever may be going on, and we just jump in and those words fall out of our mouths, again, just pull back and say, sorry. Say, look, do you know what? That's actually grand. I'm just a bit stressed out myself. Leave it off. It's okay. Remember, they're a teenager. They're going to rebel. They are going to try and find their individuality. They are going to look at you as if you came off Noah's Ark. That's just where they're at. But the more understanding you are and the more understanding you give them, the less likelihood that that relationship is going to have too many issues along the way. Um, family values is huge. When I'm working in the schools and groups, it's usually second years or TYs. So 14s and 16s maybe. And when we talk about family values, I invariably get an absolutely blank expression on their faces. But when we go into work on family values and, and teach them and explain what they are, how important they are, you know, there's negative values, positive values. I usually put them into groups and we'd write down a list of what they feel their peer group's values are. So nothing to do with them. What they feel, let's take it, the average 16 year old value, daily values are the important things in that 16 year old's life every day. And then on the other side of the page, they write what they think their values should be. So invariably, without exception, I will get values for the peers, might be social media acceptance, drink, um, smoking, relationships, popularity, whatever it may be. On the other side, I will always get honesty, family, friendships, the good stuff. So we just have a discussion as to why we feel we have to behave in a certain way, even though it goes against our values. And that conversation has a huge impact on, on these kids. And they are so appreciative to talk about it because they have to understand they don't have to behave in a certain way. They only behave in that way if they feel it's right for them. But I think in a family unit, if we get together and decide at some point, preferably when the kids are younger, what values are most important within our four walls, just your own. It's nothing to do with anybody else. And they're the strong ones. It's like that, you know, that little Chinese doll that is the base at the end. And at the very base is your values. They'll sway, they'll move, they'll change along the way. But the important few that you have decided as a parent or parents are the ones you really need to stick to. And when you teach that to your kids, they get it. And they're not too young to be talking about values at any stage in life. 
just open up that conversation and help them to understand because it does explain later on where relationships and friendships can go wrong or why they might be feeling off if they're feeling if they've gone against their own values because if any of us go against our values we just don't feel right it's the same for them um, setting expectations around values will just come up in that conversation of what you expect i'd often say you know in our family we don't behave like that in our family we don't speak to each other like that in our family we don't tell lies in our family honesty is really important get in the in our family because every family is going to be different and their friends and their peers and cousins and whoever else will all be have different ideas but you hold your family values strong and you talk about them and you keep repeating in our family they will get it and if they mess up which they will that's life they learn from it you sit down you have a conversation yes there might be consequences but then you start again because that's what we do you know as parents we just have to keep dusting them off picking them up and helping them along that path again now not making the path for them just helping them along respect for themselves and others is huge so the way they speak to themselves and i'm just going to do this little one because i'm conscious of time here so what i work with a lot when kids confidence is low is um i'd ask them to pick out and actually you do it as well just from out of interest because it's the same for the adults Pick out a name of somebody who you consider a really good friend. Anyway, keep that name in your head for a second. Now, when you notice that you're talking down to yourself or you're making negative comments to yourself or you're just not being very nice to you, just stop and ask yourself, would I talk to so-and-so like that, whatever friend you have? No, you never will because you treat them like a friend. But it's a really good one for the kids and the teens just to bring them up and say you know use their friend's name and say would you talk to so and so like that so why do you do it to yourself your job is to be a best friend to you and build yourself up there's enough people out there to bring them down so it's just a handy one that has really worked for me in work and um, so you might be able to find that a little bit useful at home as well knowing their friends and parents is a tough one because obviously in primary that's grand and you probably will know a lot of them. When it comes to secondary, it's a little bit harder. But I think where possible that you are the house that allow the kids call in normal times now, um, that is great because it gives you a really good idea on how these kids behave around each other and how they're treating each other and what respect they're showing for each other. But it's very, very difficult otherwise to understand what's going on with the friend groups when you've no idea who these friends are, who their parents are. And that's the way it is in secondary, unfortunately, that makes it a bit harder. But, you know, do encourage your kids to bring their friends home and let your house where possible be the house where they do gather. Because you will be so grateful. It just allows you to get in the heads of the other kids as well and understand what actually really is going on. Because sometimes we feel so-and-so's son or daughter is just fab and they're so nice and you should be great friends. And they might not be that nice at all. But we'll only see that if we see the way they interact and we see what's actually going on between them. So don't presume that someone is, you know, because you're friends with a parent, whatever it may be, don't presume these kids are necessarily automatically good for your kid. They mightn't be. Listen to your kids, watch their behaviour and watch the behaviour of their friends when they're around you. I suppose respecting their privacy is huge, but I think, again, we need to play clever here. So when they are allowed online, when they are spending time in their room, which most of them will spend a lot of time in their room, um, let them off. But when the time comes for family meals or for a movie or for going for a walk or study or whatever it may be, then you put your foot in and the boundaries come into play. But allow them to have that bit of privacy. They need it. The teens just... This is where they're at. And when you remember when you were a teenager, I'm sure you didn't go running telling your parents everything either. There's a certain amount of stuff we just don't need to know. And some kids will be really open and tell everything. And that's fine if that's what works for them. But for some, maybe not so much. And that's where the other trusted adult relationship can come in really handy. Because some kids, to be fair to them, they don't want to be disappointing us. They don't want to let us down. They don't want to share some of that negative stuff because it's not going to impact well on them and they don't want to hurt you. That's important to remember. But you do want them to be able to talk about things and share things. So if you feel that's going on at all, make sure there's someone in their lives that they can talk to. 
Understanding what should remain private is huge when it comes to the teenage years. So if your kids have told you something in trust and they hear you repeating it back to your mom, dad, brother, sister, friend, whoever on the phone, you've broken their trust. I see this every day with the kids I'm working with. Trust is a two way street. If they trust you with something, you have got to hold that trust or else they're going to stop and they need to know they trust you. So be very careful. Don't think that they can't hear you or they're out of earshot. Teenagers are the nosiest people on earth. They don't go out of earshot if they hear anything to do with them going on. So trust is a two way street. You, they have to be able to trust you too. Where in their privacy, you know, if they have chats with their friends, that's their business. We used to all meet with our friends and chat away. We don't need to know everything that's going on. But if you feel, and I think when the boundaries come into play, I would all, always say this, if you feel there's anything going wrong and if you feel they're behaving differently and if you feel they're withdrawing into themselves and something's up, then at the beginning when they do get that device or phone that you say, I will trust you until you give me a reason not to. But if I feel at any point that there is something going on that's not healthy for you, then I will look at your phone. And I think that's fair enough because we have to protect them. So what's private can be private until you feel it's a problem. But show them that you know that they're growing up. Explain that you understand they're growing up and that they need that independence and they need that privacy. And they'd be really grateful that you do. But we cannot helicopter over them every minute of every day because then we'll end up with kids and teenagers and young adults who have zero resilience. And there's a lot of that going on. Our kids have to be able to sort things out themselves. They have to be able to deal with different problems and issues when they arise or else they're going to struggle. So allow them the privacy to sort things out until you feel maybe things have got a bit far and you need to get involved and that's fair enough. Be a parent first, but not a friend is huge. I think a lot of people like the idea of being friends with everybody and we can still be friends. We can still have a great relationship with our kids and with our friends, but we parent first. So just when your child tells you that you're the most uncool parent on the planet, you are so strict, you don't understand, take a breath and just ignore it. You do understand and you do get it, but you are their parent. And if you feel a boundary has to be put in place and you feel that you have to implement something that they're not going to like for their safety, being realistic now, of course, then that's what you do because first and foremost, you are their parent. They have friends. Time out for parents. Um, the whole first chapter of my book is about this because I think we can all be on this little treadmill of life that gets so busy and so chaotic. And really the most important things in our lives can be forgotten about. That's ourselves, our relationship with each other, and our relationship with our kids. And if we are not in a good headspace, we cannot parent our kids in the way we want to parent them. That might mean taking an extra five minutes and driving around the block before you head into the house after work. It might mean leaving the building and taking you know, a good long walk in the evening to clear your head. At times it might mean taking up a class, doing more meditation and mindfulness, Sometimes for many of us, and myself included, I, there was a time in my life I knew I needed support. And I think it's a very brave parent who'll admit that they need that support. But get out and get it. One of the best quotes I ever heard was, the best gift I will ever give my child is to never stop working on me. And that is so true. Because the kids feel everything. So if you're stressed, if you're upset, if you're unhappy, if you're turning to drink, if you're turning to anger, whatever it may be, they're feeling it. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. Nobody is. There's no such thing. But at least give yourself the benefit by looking after yourself first. You have got to give yourself time. And they respect you for that. There is no child going to respect a parent who gives their 600% all and gives nothing to themselves. What are you teaching your kids? We have got to teach our kids that we're worthwhile as well and we matter and we need time and we have interests. They respect you all the more and you're giving them a good lesson in life. So do take that time for yourselves. Breathe and make sure you're on the right track of what you had aimed in your parenting story from the very beginning. We can't do that if we're hopping on a treadmill. Step off. Take a bit of time out. You know, and we will come out of it together, please God. Um, 
everybody has their ups and downs. Everybody's going to struggle. I think kids will bring you to the highest of emotions and the lowest and the hardest, but they're a gift. And it's only when they start moving on that you look back and you realize what an amazing gift they are. And I have worked with so many kids and with my own kids, to be honest, my own kids have taught me so much about life because they are living in a world where they're open to so much and they're allowed to be open to so much. And they have so many lessons to teach us when we allow it. So that relationship with that most important person in your world, make sure you give you time, the time it deserves. And yourself, take time for you. We all need it. What a child doesn't receive, he can seldom later give. And I love this because if that's just making sure you hug each other enough, making sure you tell them you love them, you accept them for who they are, regardless of who that person is. Your opinion matters. It is the most important opinion in your child's life. And I know they might act like they don't listen and they don't care and they don't love you and they don't even like you at times. They do and they always will. Give them everything you want to give them and think about it and give it a moment's thought. What matters, what's important, give it because you're giving them the gifts that they can pass forward in their lives to come. I hope you got a few ideas out of that one. I could go on and on, but um, I could see we're maybe time for a bit of a Q&A. So if anybody there wants to ask me anything, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I'll hand you to Jill is going to, I think, let me know thanks. if there's anything in there. Yes, thanks, Eileen. There certainly is. And look, thank you for a brilliant talk. I, as the mum of two teenagers, I could relate to almost everything you were, you were saying. And the advice is so practical in, in that I've learned new stuff and but also you've validated some of the things that I was already doing and sometimes we question ourselves when we're doing them. So thank you so much for that. There, there's, a, there's a few questions in there. If I go to the first one there, it says, what is the best way to negotiate screen time with older teenagers? Well, I suppose well, I'm presuming your kids are older now, so you've gone beyond the let's start as we mean to go on. Um, you're the parent. You need to decide that. I would say for every teenager, they need online time. It is the way they communicate. But once they have, well, if they're in the school year, once they've got their study done, their homework done, maybe helped out in the house, which uh, that's a whole other topic, had their jobs done in the house, do, did whatever you think you expect them to do, let them off then. Um, you know, they could, but, and a lot of kids are online, but actually they're on Netflix, they're on YouTube, or they could be into music and they're doing all that. So that's a very different thing to someone scrolling through um, WhatsApp or Instagram all day. Some of these kids are online because this is where their passions lie. So just keep an eye on what it is your kid is actually doing or your teenager is doing. Because for some of the more introverted kids as well, they find it much easier to socialize online. So it's a safer place for them. Once you feel your child is happy and you have your time boundary in, um, you know, once they've done everything else they need to do in the house, whether that's help out, a little bit of communication somewhere along the way, homework, study, whatever it may be, um, let them off. I'd say trust them really until you they give you a reason not to. Yeah, it's a great point because you often feel they're going from one device to another, um, you know, and, and that might be from the phone to watching a movie on TV and you're thinking it's another device, but it's a very different experience. So having that distinction is, is really important. Um, and kind of an extension of that then, uh, Eileen, should parents reward kids with technology and gaming after like physical exercise? So, you know, if you go out there to training and you give it everything or you go out there and you play your match, you can come on the computer again when you come home. Oh, I presume all of that's OK. Absolutely. I mean, it's the world they're in. And I think for us, it's really hard because, but personally me, I'm not the most savvy techie person. So I look at them on phones and I get so frustrated. And I feel, oh my God, they're missing out so much and blah, blah, blah. But really, it's their friends are in there, their interests are in there. It's all about balance. So if those kids have another interest and they've given their time to that, absolutely. You know, this is where they hang out with their friends until or if you see that they're reacting differently when they come off their online devices. Now that's different. I'd see that a lot with gaming with the boys, that they could be picked on and bullied a bit on the gaming. So if you feel your kid is upset, or just very low when they come off that device, you just need to react a little bit to that and keep an eye on what's happening. And that's the only little red flag I would shoot up on that one. And the girls are the same. And you know, when they are comparing themselves to others online and it brings them down, just keep an eye on their humor when they do come off it. But once you've got a bit of balance, 
it is the world they're in. Exactly. And um, Eileen, do you have any tips on how best to encourage them to communicate in more traditional ways like phone calls? Like, are we pushing our technology on them from our era by trying to do that or, or are we you know, better off to embrace their Phone calls? Gone? Uh, you know, are they gone? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of kids are really freaked out at the thought of actually speaking on a phone. Um, I think you can encourage them from when they're young, though, to ask for whatever it is in the shop. You know, get that communication going day one because some of the older kids are petrified. They will not go into a shop and ask for something. So from the young ones up, let them do it. Let them go up to the counter and ask for something. When the grandparents or relatives are there, really try and have no devices so that they speak. Like I've often worked with kids and I get them to draw a circle. You could do this at home and ask them to put in that circle the most important people in their world. Now that can be anything from the pet to the grandparent to the parents, whoever it may be. And then it shouldn't be too many because these are just the really important ones. And then at the end, ask them, do you feel you spend enough time with these people without your phone? I've had kids put in the, at the end of a session saying, I'm going to turn my phone off when granny calls. I haven't spent enough time with so-and-so. But we have to open these discussions because to them, the norm is the phone is their life. So it is up to us to remind them that, yes, it's great. And yes, technology is great in many ways but it's not their real life. And who is going to be there to give them that hug when they're upset? Is it someone going to jump out of their phone or is it going to be someone in that circle? Who can they really trust? Is it someone in that phone or is it someone in that circle? Have that discussion so that, and we need to keep reminding them of this because normality to them is what's inside in that device. And it's not, it's a very lonely place if people become too reliant on it because when they're not communicating with the people that they love and care about, they do become detached and they do become sad and they do become lonely and they don't understand why they're feeling that way. But when you talk to them about it and they understand that they're not actually communicating with these people that they really care about, mm -hmm. it's just like a little light goes off inside. But we just need to open the conversation and help them to understand that. And that's our role because they don't know any different. And they're not getting this information anywhere, believe me, nowhere. So it is up to us to open those conversations with them. Yeah, that, like their world can become all consuming. So I guess when, when we can open a door for them, they're, they're probably ready to walk through it a lot of the time. There, there's one here, Eileen, when your child is coping with ASD or ADD, how much of what we've just seen in this presentation applies? Um, no, I'm not, I'm no expert in any of those areas, but I think all, I think most of the above applies, to be honest. I think um, every child, needs to know the important people in their world. Every child needs to understand that those people in their world get them and understand them and accept them no matter who they are. I think one thing I didn't say, and I would say it here as well, is we will always love our kids, but we mightn't always love their behavior. And I think that's a really important one to get across. Just like our kids will always love us, hopefully, they might not like our behavior either. But I think for some of the kids to understand, you know, when you get cross and angry and react to something, especially behavioural issues, that they do understand that that is nothing to do with love. Yeah. It's just behaviour. So I think communication, communication, trust is really important the whole way through, regardless. Um, I know it can be a lot more difficult, as I say, I'm not an expert on it, but I think the basics apply to everybody. Sounds good. Um... Another one here, Eileen, how do we help our children stand up? No, how do we help our child? We'll stand up for him or herself in both the physical world and the online world. So getting, getting your child to defend themselves. Yeah, well, them. you know, so often we might say, well, why don't you just go up and tell them this or go up and ask them this? That's not going to happen ever. I think we have to teach our kids that they are resilient. And we can only teach them that by allowing them to be resilient, by giving them that extra responsibility. When I look at jobs in the house, they'll rant and rave, but they feel more capable. When they learn how to cook, it might be a pain in the butt for all of us involved, but they feel more capable. You know, when you set little goals for them, whether that's learning three spellings extra a day or practicing for a sport or music or whatever it may be, but when you set a goal and you follow it through, they feel more capable. Build them up. The only way they will ever learn to stand up for themselves is when we build them up to be stronger, resilient kids. It is not a natural thing for them to go up there and, you know, 
argue, not argue, but maybe question someone's behavior in an ideal world, that would be great. But let's face it, how many of us are going to do that either? It's a pretty hard thing to do. But I do think the stronger your kids are, the more secure they are, the more they know they're loved and accepted at home, the less they will be affected negatively. Like every kid is going to have problems with friendships and other areas growing up. There's no question about that. But if they know that they have you and they have their family home and they have that security behind them and they can communicate openly with you if something is going wrong or whether it's you or that other trusted adult, but they have to have that space that they know there is someone there who has their back and that's vital. And I think then your child will be a lot less likely to be affected by other people's behavior quite as much as they would be if they were really not confident and not resilient and not capable and not able to deal with making mistakes. We have to teach them all that, that's their job. We cannot smooth out the path. You're doing them no favors. It has to be a bit of a rocky road so that they can actually deal with everything that's going to come their way for the rest of their lives. We want to build our kids up so they can live in a world without us, as awful as that may seem. But we do because they have to be able to deal with all these things themselves. But when they're younger, they also need to know that we're there to help them and support them and pick them up along the way where needed. But give them that space to try and pick themselves up as well. Brilliant. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot about that respect you talked about earlier as well, respect for themselves and respect for, for those around them. So, you know, just having that would probably give them more confidence online as well. Um, and, and somebody's asking, someone just said, fantastic presentation, where can we buy your book? So we've got two links there on, on the uh, picture that's up on screen there. Uh, one of them is your own website and the other one is uh, Letter Tech Bookstore. So it's, it's available there for anyone who'd like to buy it. Um, and thank you, Eileen has given us uh, three copies of it to give away. So after this, we will put all the, the names of folks who joined the session into a hat and we will pull out three and we will contact those three people to, to receive the book. And I think you, you even signed it, Eileen, if I remember correctly. I it. <laughs> so it's going to be worth money. Um, but Eileen, thank you so, so much. We're up on time. It, what I really learned today, I think, is that you know what, when kids are online, they're living a kind of a 2D life and life is designed to be lived in 3D and getting them out and, you know, getting getting life to appeal to their other three senses, not just sight and sound, I think just makes them such a, a more holistic experience. So huge thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined uh, the session and um, we will make the recording available and we will get those three books out to the lucky winners as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Amelia. Have a good day, folks. Pleasure. Thanks, Thanks, Eileen. Take care. Take care, folks.